Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, let me thank APEC and the organizers for inviting me to speak at this plenary session on what will it take to end AIDS in Asia. As you know, um, Asia uh, currently has uh, 5.8 million people living with HIV. And out of those, 3.5 million are receiving antiretroviral therapy. We are a little bit behind our targeted goals of uh, reducing the number of new infections. Uh, we had a recorded number of 300,000 new infections in 2019. Similarly, uh, we are behind our targets in terms of numbers of AIDS-related deaths, having recorded 160,000 deaths in um, the whole of Asia Pacific in 2019. We're also unfortunately not doing too well in a major prevention program, and that's the prevention of mother to child transmission, where uh, it has been reported that um, the, the coverage of mother to child transmission in our region is only at 56%, with a range of 42 to 71%, when um, uh, the global average is 85%. So, um, uh, it's obvious that there is still much uh, to be done in our region, even though uh, on the whole, as you can see from this graph here, um, there, is, there has been a reduction in the number of new infections, but it falls short of the, the um, 2020 target by 90,000 um, uh, infections. So where are these infections coming from? Uh, you know, Asia is a large, uh, Asia Pacific is a large and diverse uh, region. Um, and uh, for many years now, we know that um, the uh, nature of the HIV epidemic in Asia is more of a concentrated epidemic compared to the generalized epidemic of the African region. So in 2019, the distribution of new HIV infections uh, was largely uh, uh, seen amongst uh, key populations and their partners. So 98% of new HIV infections were among um, key populations with uh, gay men and other men who have sex with men, uh, accounting for 44%. 21% of new infections uh, were seen amongst clients of sex workers and their partners. Um, sex workers, 9% uh, and people who inject drugs still uh, form a reasonably large um, percentage of people who were infected at 17%. But it's very important to remember, as, as I said earlier, that um, uh, the epidemic in Asia, although 98% um, is, is largely amongst uh, key populations, but it is a large and diverse region, and therefore the HIV epidemic is also um, very diverse, as can be seen in this last slide in um, Indonesia, where uh, you know, it, re it resembles more of a, uh, uh, um, a generalized epidemic with um, still significant number of pregnant women living with HIV um, at 12,000 pregnant li women living with HIV recorded in 2018. So it's extremely important that um, countries uh, are aware of uh, the nature of the epidemic and that we have, and that there's granular data and desegregated data in terms of where uh, and, and who um, uh, the infections um, are mostly uh, seen in. The um, other concern in the region is that um, many are unaware of the HIV status. So approximately half of those who, uh, of, of new infections are unaware of the HIV status. And um, one of the reasons for this is, uh, can be seen from this study that my colleagues, uh, Dr. Howie Lim and Thomas uh, Guadams from, from Thailand, um, conducted in a internet survey um, 
30%, up to 30% of uh, men who have sex with men from uh, 10 member ASEAN countries had never been tested in the last six months to two years. Um, and one of the uh, main reasons for not being tested is this perception of uh, low risk to HIV that um, doesn't motivate them to having uh, HIV testing. Another concern in the region is the um, uh, widespread uh, um, use of um, chemsex. Um, as can be seen here uh, in this uh, study, looking at uh, the phenomena of chemsex among MSM in, in the Asian re Asia Pacific region. Uh, there's uh, widespread use in Vietnam, Thailand, uh, to some extent Malaysia, Australia and Japan, which uh, increases uh, the risk of HIV transmission amongst men who have sex with men. So uh, not only is the epidemic uh, diverse in the region, but uh, amongst uh, the subset uh, that's related to substance use, um, the concern is, of course, uh, the uh, changing trend in drug use pattern and therefore the response will also need to um, match those uh, changing trends from uh, the heroin epidemic and uh, the, the standard response of needle syringe program and methadone or, or other um, opiate, subs opiate um, substitution therapy to um, programs that address uh, the newer um, uh, substance use uh, in the region. Another challenge uh, in, in the region is that of um, the performance in the HIV testing and treatment cascade. Um, the 1990 goals by and large have not been met by many countries in the region. Um, in this uh, UNH report, in this year's UNH report, um, it's estimated that only uh, that the uh, HIV testing, the first 90, was achieved um, at 75% instead of the 90%, even lower in terms of the number of people who are living with HIV receiving treatment at 60% uh, as opposed to the 90 goal and 55% uh, um, uh, having undetectable viral loads uh, instead of the desired 90. So obviously uh, in the treatment cascade, um, the region also still has a lot of work to do. This graph uh, shows that um, another uh, challenge is uh, in, in, in the region is uh, that many people in many countries in the region present with advanced disease. Uh, it is only in countries like Brunei, uh, Cambodia, Australia and, and New Zealand where the majority of patients present with um, CD4 of greater than 350. In, in the majority of country, 50% or less uh, of patients present uh, with uh, a healthy CD4 count, uh, signifying that many uh, still uh, you know, pre are presenting late and uh, as was shared earlier, are unaware of their HIV status until they present with an opportunistic infection. And this is uh, obviously uh, not uh, um, uh, you know, favorable state of affairs, considering um, in the last uh, two to three decades, we have a huge um, toolbox for both uh, treatment and prevention. We have a lot of tools in those two toolboxes uh, for treatment and prevention that, um, you know, has given the world uh, the confidence to, to declare um, the ending of AIDS in 2030. But from uh, the figures that I've just shared with you in, in our region, in Asia and Pacific, um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in order to end AIDS by 2030. This uh, is um, a graph again from the UNAIDS report from this year, which shows that uh, for many countries, the coverage of those uh, uh, evidence-based uh, preventive tools 
uh, are not at the desired levels. Many are not even approaching 50% of coverage, whether it's for um, people who inject drugs or whether it's for female sex workers or gay men in uh, all the kinds of um, specific tools that we know can prevent HIV in each of the different uh, key population. And of course, when it comes to PrEP, um, uh, as you can see from this graph, from this map here, um, very few countries have uh, you know, achieved uh, PrEP rollout uh, in Asia Pacific. We have Australia and uh, Thailand and uh, countries in the Indochina region but uh, many countries in the region are still having uh, pilot uh, programs, in, including my own, and have not achieved the desired uh, levels of uh, PrEP coverage that uh, can see uh, the end of AIDS. So what are the barriers? I think uh, it's very well known that uh, stigma is Achilles heel of um, the HIV response uh, globally, not just in Asia and the Pacific. And uh, this is a, a survey done in, in the region that shows the multiple layers of stigma that um, individuals in Asia and the Pacific um, uh, suffer from, whether they're sex workers, MSM, or uh, transgenders, people who inject drugs, or migrants. And what that leads to is uh, reduced access to health services, reduced access to preventive care, reduced access to uh, treatment services. 61% felt ashamed at either having, uh, uh, either because they're living with HIV or, um, uh, or belong to any of these key populations. 7% uh, um, reported having been denied uh, sexual and reproductive health services. Um, a good 10% still uh, were denied health services. And as I said, as a result of that, nearly a quarter of those surveyed um, avoid going to uh, local clinics. So, so it's no surprise that um, in that graph that I showed you earlier, that uh, up to 50% of um, people living with HIV in the Asia Pacific region present um, at very low CD4 counts. The uh, issue of uh, stigma is, is not just uh, amongst uh, the public or, or the lay population. The concern is that uh, stigma is also is very much uh, alive and well in um, amongst healthcare workers. Uh, and this is a survey that we did uh, here in Kuala Lumpur, which shows high levels of stigma towards transgenders um, amongst but by healthcare workers. And this is again from uh, this year's Global AIDS report. Um, it's you know, uh, mind boggling to believe that um, in 2018, 20, 2018 that um, the, the level that, you know, slightly more than a third of uh, people who were surveyed still think that uh, they shouldn't purchase vegetables from a shopkeeper living with HIV in this region. So it just drives home further that uh, stigma is alive and well in the region that partially explains many of those numbers that I just shared with you that um, makes it a, a, a huge, huge challenge um, towards achieving ending AIDS by 2030. So what are some of the um, uh, re uh, reasons for this high level of stigma in our region? I think one of the major drivers is the many laws that uh, impede HIV response that add to the uh, stigmatization that includes uh, uh, criminalization of many of the behaviors that uh, put people at risk. For example, uh, in the region, uh, 37 countries still criminalize sex work. 11 countries have compulsory detention centers for people who inject drugs. 15 have de the death penalty for the same. And 16 out of 38 countries still criminalize same-sex relations. And uh, 10 countries impose some form of restriction on entry for 
people living with HIV. To compound all that globally, as, as we all know, uh, there is a um, growing conservatism in the political and social environment that's, um, that increases uh, uh, the, the level of um, uh, stigmatization towards a uh, key population. I'll just skip this, uh, which just shows the, the countries that still have uh, many laws and, and policies. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, three countries in the region have uh, achieved the 1990 90 goals, Thailand, Cambodia, and Australia, uh, in this year's uh, Global AIDS report, um, have uh, reported achieving those 1990-90 goals. So how did they do it? And I think, um, you know, given the, the, the level of uh, stigma that uh, I just shared with you, um, one of the answers to uh, overcoming um, these uh, uh, levels of stigma, particularly in healthcare settings, is to, to see and to um, encourage uh, key population-led health services to fill the, the service gaps and to, to mitigate the reluctance of uh, individuals to come forward to uh, healthcare settings for fear of uh, stigma and discrimination. And uh, the Thailand key population led health services ensures accessibility, availability, acceptability, and quality that can be uh, emulated and replicated in countries around the region or, or have been, you know, uh, I think if you look at the programs, the successful programs, in both uh, Cambodia and, and Australia, as well as Thailand, uh, they're some of the elements that, um, uh, that that uh, ensures uh, increased coverage and increased uh, care for uh, both prevention and treatment services. And these are some of the um, results of KP-led services for HIV testing and PrEP services that saw an increase in the number of people um, being uh, started on PrEP and remain on PrEP in Thailand. This is another example from Vietnam, where uh, again, key population-led uh, prevention and treatment program uh, called the DRIVE project in Haiphong uh, was successful in reducing HIV incidence, reducing uh, percentage of HIV seropositives and, and achieving viral suppression and uh, uh, engaging and, and scaling up uh, uh, needle syringe programs uh, and, and uh, uh, linkage to um, methadone-assisted therapy and ART that was very much uh, key population-led. Further examples from Vietnam in HIV testing, uh, looking at uh, key population-led uh, uh, services and, and uh, many, many other such examples in the region. The other key elements, I think, in ensuring um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, increase uh, scale up of treatment and prevention services. Uh, treatment services in particular is to integrate um, not just prevention and treatment services uh, from HIV testing to uh, PrEP initiation, but also HIV testing, PrEP initiation and substance use and mental health um, and STD services in a one-stop center in this uh, wonderful program called HERO in uh, Taiwan. And finally, um, I think it's going to be very difficult to end AIDS in Thailand without addressing some of those laws uh, that still exist in many countries that I shared with you earlier. Uh, Malaysia had earlier uh, looked at uh, decriminalization of uh, drug use, and I think some work continues in that, um, but obviously it's going to take uh, some time. And finally, um, none of uh, the uh, programs are going to be successful without looking at uh, the issue of funding, which 
um, is going to be even more uh, challenging in this post-COVID era. This wonderful paper from Dr. Nitya uh, looks at uh, you know, the, the importance of uh, increasing domestic funding for key population-led and civil society organizations that have proven themselves as have been seen in some of the programs that I shared with you earlier. So in, in summary, what will it take to end AIDS in Asia? Obviously, in the absence of uh, vaccine and cure, I think the number one, uh, the major um, uh, um, thing is for countries and national programs to understand their local epidemics down to um, the sub-national level and respond accordingly. Um, secondly, as has been shown with some of the successful programs that I shared earlier, it has to be a people-centered, integrated, peer-led, KP-led approach. Uh, we didn't have enough time to talk about the importance of technology and dig digitally enabled uh, programs such as HIV self-testing that uh, is, is web-based or app-based adequately resourced and finally in a safe, supportive and non-criminalizing physical and virtual uh, service and environment. It is possible, we have seen great examples from Cambodia, uh, how it can be done. We've seen great examples from Thailand, how it can be done in this, in this New York Times article from a couple of years ago. The key thing is to have uh, universal health coverage, leadership from all levels of society, from patient groups, civil society, academia, clinicians, political leaders, working hand in hand, backed by science and research and a sound financial investment, are uh, all the elements that ensure success as uh, Australia has uh, shown uh, for many years now. And finally, um, I love this quote from Nitya Panupak, which says the paternalistic and hierarchical healthcare systems in the Asia Pacific are things that will need to be addressed because they have been um, key to delaying advancement in ending HIV uh, strategies in uh, the region. So with that, um, I'd like to thank my colleagues um, uh, acknowledge here for uh, their work, of course, and but also for sharing their data and their slides with me. Thank you very much.